Hello, and welcome to season four, episode three of the ESG Experience, the podcast about all things ESG and beyond. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes into the ESG universe, this podcast is for you. Together, we'll navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, share strategies, and discuss industry news and trends. I'm Healy Lev, SVP of ESG Operations at Conservice. And I'm Ryan Nelson, SVP and General Manager of ESG at Conservice. Today, we are lucky enough to be joined by Jennifer Jenny Sojkovic to discuss why food is frequently left out of the ESG discussion, despite being a large part of the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, um, and a critical component of climate goals. Um, so I will tell you a bit about our esteemed guest today, uh, whose time we are very fortunate to have, as she is a busy lady out there truly changing the world um, with every uh, breath of her being in soul. She's amazing, big fan. Um, so Jennifer is the founder of Vegan Women's Summit, a media and events platform of over 60,000 women founders, investors, and advocates. She's a co-founder of Joyful Ventures, a social impact venture fund investing in the future of sustainable protein. She's the author of the best-selling book, The Future of Food is Female. I mean, F yeah on that title, it's perfect. The world's first book focused on women in alternative protein. Jennifer is an independent director of Natural Order Acquisition Company, a publicly traded company focused on sustainable protein. She built her career under Ron Conway, founder of SV Angel. Jennifer worked as the industry's leading lobbyist for the world's largest tech companies, including Google, Microsoft, and Meta. What haven't you done? That might have been like a shorter bio to read for next time. Just a suggestion. Uh, you know, you forgot I'm a rescue diver. Really important. <laughs> yeah. Super cool. I did want to, I, I did pick up one thing. Uh, a tri-citizen of the U.S., Canada, and the U.K., an avid traveler, athlete, rescue diver, and ethical vegan. So hopefully okay, uh, best okay. rescue diver. <laughs> what is it? What is it for the layman, the lay person, the lay woman? Rescue diver. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So uh, it's a certification. It's the one under dive master that you can get where we are literally trained to rescue folks from the bottom of the ocean. Uh, less than 10% of rescue divers are women. It's a predominantly male certification, uh, much like the scuba diving space tends to be. Uh, so yeah, if you need help at the bottom of the ocean, I'm your girl. <laughs> what about the people in the submarine? Did they call you in? A little bit deeper than I'm willing to go. Yeah, I can go maybe 120 feet. They're into like the tens of thousands, I think. <laughs> we won't hold that against you, I suppose. Yeah, so, I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah, um, lots of cool topics today. Uh, vegan and obviously, you know, female driven uh, passion here. Maybe if if we can, I'd like to just tiptoe into that one for a second because I, I find it somewhat interesting have you seen the movie barbie i have not seen it yet i ah. unfortunately haven't i know a good amount about it but okay, i haven't seen I, it i just saw it and i thought it is pretty interesting maybe after you see it we'll talk about it to unpack the point of view and the kind of the history of the toy itself and then yeah. the way that this movie approaches it in my opinion, it was almost an apology for the trouble that they were part of, um, but also tried to tell their story of all the great things and the inspiration that they had intended uh, for this doll. So I thought it was a very uh, funny, um, but very interesting thing to, to kind of unpack. So maybe we'll regroup on that after you see it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm pretty familiar. I know a number of folks who worked on the film and I know that the film was, well, it's very controversial as I've mm -hmm. seen. It in mainstream American culture, it's definitely, you know, pushing the boundaries in terms of, of a progressive feminist message. And, you know, for a lot of people that grew up on Barbies, myself included, uh, it was always, to me, Barbie was all the things that I could grow up to be. But certainly that was not um, what the experience was for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. I uh, definitely recommend um, seeing it. The yeah. other thing, of course, um veganism i've done a, a it's always been an interest of mine i am i do not practice a, a vegan lifestyle but it's been an interest and then um i saw you know referring to yourself as an ethical vegan so i did a little bit of research uh on that and kind of the different components of veganism but yeah maybe you could tell us a little bit about 
your choice as an ethical vegan and then how VWS even came to be. Yeah, absolutely. So I have been vegan for about nine years now, so just shy of a decade, uh, meaning that um, I don't consume any animal products, so everything from milk, dairy, eggs, honey, all the way to I don't wear any animal products as well. Um, I just bought a fully vegan leather electric Mustang. Um, I am through and through a big part of the animal free innovation movement. Uh, one thing I will say that's a little funny and we can talk about later in the conversation is I have had quite a bit of cultivated meat. The jury is still out on whether cultivated meat is um, considered vegan or not. Big, big conversation happening right now in the food space. But Myself, um, having been do doing this personally for about a decade, uh, I had a personal tragedy that happened to me that really changed my view of the world. Uh, when I was younger, my husband's best friend was murdered. And as we were going through the murder trial, we were faced with a number of very big ethical and moral decisions, one of them being, would we forgive the murderer for what he did? Mm. And so... We did decide to do that, went to the prison, forgave the murderer. And as we developed this more compassionate side of ourselves, we realized that we weren't actually that compassionate in our actions. You know, what is the thing that you do three times a day? Are you actually a part of building a more compassionate world? So for myself, that's very much the impetus of, of changing the way that I eat and live. Uh, and it's been a core to who I am for, uh, like I said, just shy of a decade now, really did flip the script on everything that I had imagined for myself in my life and the kind of person that I've grown up to be. Uh, it's been an interesting decade long journey. So I'm happy to pause there for a second before I get into the genesis of a vegan women's summit. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's wow. an <laughs> incredible story. Yeah. Very, um, uh, very interesting story and the, the intentional evaluation of you know forgiving that person and yeah. that process that you went through um th yeah that's very inspirational yeah and i love it i respect you both so jenny you as a vegan ryan you as a vegetarian me as a heathen um who also poses as like an animal lover i love animals i do and i still i still eat them and i realize that does make me a terrible person and maybe it is I hope I don't have to go through such a life trauma, um, maybe perhaps to wake up and realize it. But I do respect, you know, what you guys are doing, most definitely. That was me before, you know, <laughs> I was definitely, I was raised eating like nuggets and fries. And that was, I, I, I honestly, if you had talked to people that knew me as a teenager and you said, this is what Jenny's going to grow up to be one day, they would never believe it. I'm probably the last person that anyone would have ever believed would take on this kind of role. And, you know, I think that your story is more common than not. A lot of people, in fact, the vast majority of people, they don't agree with the way that we produce meat, right? But they don't see a solution for themselves in terms of how they can align that moral action with their day-to-day -day actions. And so yeah. that was a big part of why I created Vegan Women's Summit because I wanted to find a way to empower the 51% of, of uh, women that are on this planet who buy 93% of the food on this planet to be a part of this movement. Um, it's very important for us to understand that the food choices that people make, they're not made in a vacuum. They're made because of a vast array of things that are going on in a person's life. And so how can we continue to make the better, the kinder, the more sustainable, the more ethical decisions accessible to people? How do we communicate to them? And so the whole genesis of Vegan Women's Summit was really how do we find um, that through way to women consumers who we know control the grocery carts of this world? That makes sense. I was going to ask why it was specifically Vegan Women Summit, other than you know the the feminist undertones in everything that you do, which by the way, I'm a huge fan supporter, obviously. Um, but that makes sense because they're the consumers, right? They're buying most of the food, so that absolutely makes sense. And yeah, some of it is just habits, or like it's just ingrained in who you are. Like when we traveled to Asia years ago, and people were eating bugs, right? Like they're eating fried grasshoppers and stuff. I'm like, that's disgusting. Like it's not disgusting to them because they grew up eating fried grasshoppers, right? And in our culture, that's not the norm. So um, yeah, it is hard certainly to break those habits. No excuses. And I I do want to go back to Barbie, but maybe not at the moment. Cool. Anytime. Um, no, it's, yeah, it's very interesting. So, um, 
let's you mentioned trying to unpack the um cell-based lab-grown cultivated meat if cultivated meats meets the the term we want to use i'm super interested and obviously you don't have the answer yet um which is what i thought would be the conclusion that this is it's so complex it's it usually when you look to a vegan or tapita or somebody they have very clear answers and this one's a, a little confusing is what i gather do you have a personal point of view yet or you're kind of let the, letting the experts talk through it and come to an ethical conclusion or what, what do you think so first and foremost the first cultivated meat company in the world received its earliest funding from PETA little known fact in 2008 PETA re released a research grant about the quest to develop in vitro meat is what it was called at the time so in terms of the ethical side of the way that we eat, cultivated meat has always been on the side of vegans, vegetarians, those that want to move away from factory farming. Now, just because PETA and Mercy for Animals and Humane Society and all of these big, big vegan nonprofits are supporting it, doesn't mean that vegans are going to consume it. That's a very different question. And that's something that's really important to me because as I work, I invest, I consume, I support, I advocate, I write books on cultivated meat. I'm one of the world's probably top experts in this space when it comes to, you know, the way that that we are going to transition our food system. And so, yes, cultivated meat aligns with the ethos of a vegan world, which is to eliminate suffering in as best ways that we can. Is it for vegans to eat? Probably not. Uh, certainly in some iterations, the iterations that are currently on the market, there is still some small amounts of slaughtered animal that are in the product. So both the ones that have been approved in the United States, which would be good meat and upside foods, they do still contain some aspects of slaughtered uh, animal. And then of course, in Singapore for the last few years, they also have had a similar product. Can we get to a point where there is no animal products used whatsoever in cultivated meat? Absolutely. Now, keep in mind, cultivated meat already greatly, greatly reduces the amount of, of animals, right? We slaughter 90 billion animals a year. Even as it stands now, it is a drastically more ethical, more sustainable option. Uh, but it's it's a hard thing to, to consider because the binary has always been exploitation of animals is inextricably linked to meat consumption because you had to exploit an animal to make meat. We are now flipping that on its head. It is a totally new binary and conversation to have and one that a lot of folks are trying to understand how to grapple with. Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate the nuance there. So sure, I'm ab absolutely for cultivated meat as I've seen it. I've been following a little bit um, and, you know, I really got to dig in to have a, a super strong opinion but yeah i'm for it i mean the trade-offs and what we're trying it is absolutely the future of where we're going and not not only um which is extremely important like top priority for me like not having to, to kill animals or kill so many animals even is a huge 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 improvement so that's great and then i imagine we've still got 700 million people that go to bed hungry every night so i imagine that is perhaps part of this solution uh, or, or how it works towards that as, as well. Yeah, absolutely. So the way that our food system is currently structured, as I'm sure you've discussed on many other episodes, is pretty bonkers, right? So 45% of all crops that are grown on the planet are grown for livestock feed. Mm -hmm. uh, when, we, when we look at the Colorado River, right? So 40 million Americans, one in eight Americans, lives off of the Colorado River as its water source. Eight different states, the upper four and the lower four, all are relying upon that arterial water source for us, in, including as well, of course, Mexico. 70% of that water source is going towards alfalfa farming to feed cattle. So the way that we are currently using our resources, we're getting hit multiple ways because not only do we have to use land, energy, water to grow the crops to feed these animals, which we can then repurpose for human consumption, but we also had the actual cost of the animal itself. And so depending on which animal it is, that can be tremendous. Um, you know, we know anywhere from 
15 on the low end, upwards of 20 on the high end of all greenhouse gas emissions on the planet globally are created through animal agriculture, predominantly cows, right? Cows yeah. are three years to raise, to slaughter. Um, in California, where I am right now, the dairy industry in California uses as much water for their cows as the cities of San Diego and San Jose combined per year. So it is a tremendous amount of resources that we can then repurpose for other people to have nutritious food. Isn't it also too, though, and not all points taken, I heard it's something like 90 gallons of water to grow like a single head of lettuce something like that also like there there's like just the the farming like the the way that it is in general whether it's to raise livestock or even to just artificially grow vegetables is just not sustainable yeah so in terms of the most water intensive crops that we grow uh, in the united states right so the, the three most water intensive would be pasture which is used for feeding cows um then it would be alfalfa which is used for feeding cows, um, like a very, very scant amount goes towards humans. And then you get into almonds and then you can kind of start to go down the list of more of like, you know, almonds, um, chocolate actually uses quite a bit of greenhouse gas emissions and asparagus, like, yes, then we can get into some of the other aspects of it. If you're still saying that the, the lion's share is going to the livestock and to the raising of animals. Yeah, exactly. Because of that double hit of both the rearing of the animal itself and growing all of the land or growing all of the crops on that land, it, yeah. it kind of hit yeah. both. And so what's particularly insidious about what's going on in the Colorado right now, the Biden administration had to step in and issue water cuts for these eight states. And 70 percent of all that alfalfa, which is most of our water here in California is actually exported. So these are products that we are growing using, you know, what is at the moment a non-renewable source, um, water source here in the United States. We're actually exporting it to other countries. So we're not even getting the food ourselves. Okay, so we've kind of decided, and this has been my journey a little bit, like it's gonna be a long time before humans decide not to eat meat. So now the angle is, which is brilliant, let's make meat differently. Because the idea of like making everyone a vegetarian or a vegan is pretty far out there for a long time. So let's make meat so we can go here, here's the meat that, that you require uh, so many times a day. So then we started making plant-based meat and now we're making something that's cell-based meat. So that's very interesting, it can be effective. And then the nuance that um, I can, that it's easy for me to see that that's a, uh, a solution and moves us in the right direction, but still decide that I don't want to eat it or vegan, any particular individual can be like, I don't want to eat it, but yes, I'm going to invest in it. I'm going to support it. I want it to be the way that we solve for some of these challenges. And I talked about the amount of people that are still hungry. And what we want to talk about today a little bit too was maybe how can we all get this discussion more relevant in ESG as maybe standards comes out, come out and things happen because you're right. If we look at the SDGs, I quickly connected food to at least five of them, right? At, at least easily directly connected to five of the, the SDGs. Um, we know it's an issue. People being hungry is a, a, almost tragic, you know, th that many people especially. So um, food has to do with the E, it has to do with the S for sure. Um, you can connect it to, to governance. So, But what are you seeing? You, you think that maybe food perhaps is not at the top of the list in the in those types of discussions it's not it's it's absolutely not and many of the folks that are in the space that have done this for a really long time especially from the climate perspective we're really seeing a lot of the same tactics that fossil fuels were using back in the 80s and 90s and so where the meat industry is today meat and dairy in particular right those are the two that are the largest drivers of greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, cattle represent a third of all methane on the planet, right? So a human caused methane. And so they are kind of the next big conversation, I think, when it comes to climate. But we're still in that early era where there's a lot of misdirecting. There's a lot of misinformation going on. A lot of the exact same tactics we saw early on in the 80s and 90s 
with not talking about the pollution from fossil fuels, we're now seeing with meat and dairy. Um, there's absolutely a playbook. Everybody knows this. We're all familiar. Anyone that's in the ESG space, we know how this conversation was pushed out for so many decades because lobbying is very effective. I know it because I was a lobbyist for many years, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so how do we identify these these problems and really target these problems in a way that we don't push this another 20 years before it's too late um that's that's what i think is most important here because there is a lot of misinformation that's going on there is a lot of um propaganda kind of campaigns that are spinning up right now to make people not believe that information is correct and again same thing we saw with tobacco with fossil fuels other industries similarly that's the that's the biggest challenge we have because we have a really big internet that's out there um, that is available now in a way that prior conversations moving forward the climate movement it wasn't so much of a factor but with things like social media and 50 percent of people getting their food and diet decisions from social media influencers it's like a whole new ball game yeah so one tactic i suppose is to write a book um obviously uh just reading right from the headline here reforming our food system is the single most important challenge facing humanity today so um i could i could get my head around that i could agree with that it's the single most important challenge facing humanity uh and then of course and women are leading the charge hence the future of food is female but um yeah i um the single most important challenge. Uh, maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, when it comes to the conversation around climate and we look at the best climate mitigation effects that we can, you know, be doing, we know by far and large, food is the easiest, most efficient mitigation tactic. Uh, so BCG did a report last summer that found that investing in plant-based protein was 11 times more effective than investing in electric vehicles, which is where they put the majority of the federal funding in the last year. You know, that was a massive aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But we know it was not the most efficient use of dollars for reducing emissions. It's four times more effective than green buildings. It's three times more effective than decarbonizing cement. Decarbonizing cement is widely known as, as one of the biggest, biggest areas of, of reducing emissions. And so if the data shows that simply changing the production methods of our food is the most efficient way to reduce emissions quickly, why are we not doing that? Why does our government over index yeah. for spaces that we know are less efficient when it comes to emissions reduction? Why are we not asking that question more? And why, why aren't they? Why do you think they're not? The reality is that the United States, you know, for better or for worse, largely was built off of the economy of the meat industry. It's a massive aspect of why we became the superpower that we are today. It's a massive aspect of places like Brazil, uh, places like Australia, you know, places like Canada, where I'm from. It is inextricably linked to the economy um, when it comes to meat, dairy, and eggs. And so unraveling the difference between government and the meat industry it's almost impossible here in the united states yeah i noticed that we talked it about uh, talked about it on another podcast that we did talk about food i think it was in the context of waste but it came up so this was like an anecdote that reminded me so um when i registered my kids for school okay there's like a million questions in the questionnaire you have to answer them and most of them um you have to like opt in Okay, like, do you want to take the bus? Yes. Do you want to? All these things. Then there's this one question buried in there about milk. And it's like, they word it in such a way, it's like, do you not want your kid to sometimes yes, <laughs> not have milk, sometimes yes. And you have to like, and mm -hmm. the, as the default, it's going to default to your kid getting milk. Like, they're just pushing it is the point. So you have to like thoughtfully think about how the question's worded. So I made the mistake the first year. I was, I accidentally signed them up for milk and I had to call and I had to get it canceled. But the point is like, it's in there so strong that like, the first inclination is to like push the milk so that the kids start drinking milk every day at school and it start like adopting. So I can see what you're talking about, that some of the things like that are so systemic that it would be very hard to start to unravel that, right? Because if you say, hey, schools stop doing milk, then whoever's pushing the milk, the dairy farmers, the lobbyists, to your point, you know, they're not, they have such a strong hold, they're not going to allow that to happen, right? Yeah. So, so that, that's a, that's a law. 
that you're you're referring to the dairy checkoff program. The USDA has a law that you must serve fluid dairy milk in U.S. public schools. That's crazy. Yeah, That's so crazy. And now it sounds like the thesis is that now that we're drawing some attention to it, people like yourself and others who are saying this is a way to maybe lead the climate solution by addressing food. Um, so now we're getting the attention. So they're probably amping up the lobbying a little bit more and using new tactics and the internet and all that. So I, I'm thinking what, what I'm hearing is much like when we started attacking fossil fuels and then that got amped up for a long time or big tobacco or whatever it is, yeah. then, you know, they protect everything gets, you know, a lot of attention and they amp it up and they get protected. So if there's a playbook on that side, maybe we've learned something and there's a playbook to get past it. I know that I just in my journey, I experienced where I could stop having the is climate change real discussion. And then I could eventually stop having the is climate change, you know, from humans is a portion of it, human caused. So like I, the, the whole time I was always arguing, is it real or is it not? I'm talking about when I was even like 12, right? And then like 15 years old, is it real? No, it's not. You're on the wrong side, blah, blah, blah. Finally, now that's it, so marginalized in my experience i don't even engage in those conversations the world that i'm working with we're just talking about solutions and what to do and did you see that and did you see that so i'm maybe excited for that inflection point uh as we get a little bit farther you know along the journey with meat yeah how many other laws are there like that like with regards to food that would just be so tough to undo are there a lot yes Haley, there is a lot uh this is a rabbit hole of which you will not escape when you start to go down it. Um, you know, the school lunch program is a $15 billion uh, industry. Uh -huh. It's mostly run by Tyson Foods, the largest chicken producer in the country, and Pepsi. The National Dairy Council is part of the School Nutrition Associ Alliance, which is the watchdog for children's nutrition. Like, this is very, very, very deep. Um, and the yeah. easiest way to see it so just really quickly, so in 1990, Congress passed um, a Dairy Promotions Act that specifically gave U.S. federal dollars towards the dairy industry to promote milk. At the time, milk consumption was starting to drop. That's yeah. where Got Milk came from. Mm -hmm. The Got yeah. Milk, you remember when we were all younger, that was funded by the government. By the government, yeah. 100 plus celebrities that we saw and put, you know pinned up on our walls. That was a marketing campaign that was run by MilkPep, which is a spinoff of the federal government's program that they created. And so to this day, like so much of the marketing that you have seen around you has actually been inadvertently through your taxpayer dollars. So there's the dairy checkoff program. There's the beef checkoff program as well. It goes very, very deep um, when you get into it. But milk is the one that is perhaps the most obvious to folks because fluid milk consumption has dropped to the lowest in American history as of this year. And so they're actually dumping milk at the schools across the United wow. States because it's required that they have to buy it for kids like yours, but no. they don't, the kids don't want it. So they're actually dumping milk every week now. Wow. Yeah, even the ones that sign up for it, I'm sure take two sips and throw it away. But you're saying they're overbuying it anyways, like they're not even buying it for the correct. They have to buy for every student. It's a law they have to buy for every student, whether or not can't we make them drink in. it. Yeah. Oh, wow. that is, yeah. That's so, so and, that's, and that's what I'm saying, you know, when it comes to like, what have we learned? Well, there is a level of entrenchment that me and dairy in particular have to our government that we have not seen necessary like fossil fuels of course energy is a big aspect of, of the federal government and and there's so many kickbacks and ties there that we've had to untangle for for decades but it's not to the level that this industry is so this is a totally new ball game when it comes to how we really deconstruct the way that we produce food in this country how do we create the level playing field? One of the reasons why you don't have people buying as many impossible burgers as beef burgers is because that impossible burger is the true cost of what it takes to grow those products. That beef burger is heavily subsidized and those yeah. consumers don't have to see that true cost. And that is why that impossible burger, despite the fact that it uses way less resources, is actually way less expensive to produce. 
will still show up as more expensive when it comes to the store because they're not getting that same level of subsidies. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's not a fair marketplace. No, yeah. it's it's like um, set up to fail out of the gate. So it sounds like so we're you as an advocate for this are up against a lot, right? Like trying to take down the government and things like that. What are success stories that you've had, um, you know, like that give you hope or like keep you going? Like, have there been any headway? Has there been any headway made in like taking down these laws or these things that really just make it impossible or the subsidies you talk about that make it impossible for this industry to get a foothold? Yeah, so I would say, I mean, certainly we are the second country in the entire world to regulate and approve the sale of cultivated meat. That's something that if, you know, only five years ago, that seemed like it would, it could never happen, right? Okay, that's huge. Things change very quickly. The United yeah. States is the biggest meat, you know, by most metrics, it's the biggest meat market in the entire world. So that signals to the entire world that yeah. this country that leads the way in this conversation says this is the way the future is going. And so there's dozens of countries that because of that regulate regulatory ruling are now going to speed up and, and likely move through their approval process in the next six to 18 months. So that's huge, right? And the more we talk about this conversation, the more I think it's important for us to remember that all of these new products, whether it's an impossible burger or a cultivated meat burger, or maybe something in between, maybe it's just like fungi, mycelium. There's a million different ways that we can feed the American population and the global population. These all represent opportunities for us. So it's not about taking down the government, taking down the meat industry, taking down the dairy industry. It's about the next great American food story. Um, we essentially invented, I mean, we invented industrialized animal agriculture in the United States. Uh, fun fact, 100 years ago this year, 1923, we invented meat processing. The way that we eat on this planet was largely created here. So the way that we eat in the future can also be created here. It's an opportunity. It's not just about, it's not a, you know, zero sum game. It's about the evolution of how we produce food. Uh, and then, you know, certainly from a national security standpoint, it's a very important conversation that we need to be having because with the droughts increasing, with the, yeah. you know, climate crisis continuing to wreak havoc upon the way that we grow crops, there will be more and more food shortages and there is not a real solution for those. And so securing the food system for Americans is going to be very top of mind. And it's something that we're seeing a lot more legislatures look at, legislators look into both on the left and right, because yeah. eating is a bipartisan issue. <laughs> right, yeah. So to that point and to the point that Ryan made earlier about, you know, you're not going to get a bunch of meat eaters to convert. What do you think will be the inflection point? Like, do you think it will come to something as nasty as like, like mass food shortages where people are like, wake up, we really have to do something, cannot keep eating steak? Or like, what do you think will be the inflection point? Do you think it will come to disaster before people actually mainstream adopt these other products? Well, we did have some pretty serious meat shortages that happened during the pandemic of which several billion dollars of bailout money was handed out you know from our government and so there is a point i believe where our government no longer sees it's viable to continue to bail out this industry um because we need to show that we have built up enough scale and production on the other side of protein production for our government to say, oh, actually, we, we're betting on the wrong horse here, for lack of a better term. Let's yeah. move it over to here. We are yeah. nowhere near that point yet. Yeah. We are very early. We've got a lot of work to go. This is generational work. Yeah. But we have seen this happen before. We have seen old technologies get replaced by new technologies. I mean, you can read the famous quote by Henry Ford. You know, if I'd asked them what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Right, right. Yeah. Well, until it's not. And so I think that that's a huge piece of the puzzle is when we get that government support. And there is governments around the world that are much, much, much more interested in this than the U.S. government. Singapore, Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, all the places where they have no ability to produce, you know, they don't have space for cattle ranching and industrial right. animal production they're already on board um the us is kind of in a transition i think 
Uh, but to your, to your larger question about is there going to be an existential threat, well, we do have the worst avian flu pandemic in the history of the world happening currently, yeah. and you're still going to the store and getting your chicken. So, yeah. you know. Well, eggs were like um, $17 a carton for a couple of weeks, and it wasn't prohibitive, but it was definitely a conversation. When the other, it was a couple of months ago, maybe the first wave of the avian flu, and the eggs actually were like really expensive. Yeah, they were, yeah. but but unfortunately they went down in price because yeah. those chickens, you know, it takes 40 days in the United States to raise a chicken from egg to slaughter, 25 mm -hmm. to 28 days in Europe, right? And so those momentary blips can easily be backfilled, unfortunately, with the industrialized system we have, yeah. where they cannot be easily backfilled is cattle. Cattle take three years, mm -hmm. and that is where I think we will see the first real breaking points. Mm -hmm. So uh, something I just heard this morning on my bike ride in uh, on N NPR, uh, maybe you know more about this. Uh, I can only paraphrase what I heard, but there's a food and security council in the UN and like the people that, that run the agenda change like monthly and it's the U.S.'s turn right now and we're putting food at the top of the agenda. So they're positive. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that there's, I mean, you saw COP28 has announced after a very severe backlash of, of um, COP27 that I was actually at last year. It was all meat. There was a huge backlash that, that they were not making any efforts to reduce meat or, or promote plant-based. So the new one this year in Dubai said that they will um, be mostly plant-based. So that was pretty big, right? Um, and that's not surprising because places like the UAE, like I said, they're, they are nations that already exist in the constraints where America will end up, unfortunately, at one point. Uh, and so you will see a lot of leadership in other parts of the world first. They won't be the size of America. These are definitely going to be smaller countries, but desert nations and island nations are already where we're heading. Um, I wanted to mention, see if anyone remembers this. Um, the first time I kind of heard about lobbying, it, it reminded me of the stories of Got Milk. And then I think Milk It Does a Body Good was one of them. Yeah. And you like definitely was ingrained that you need it for your bones or you're in big trouble. So all that. But the one where I really learned about lobbying, if this really happened, do you remember where uh, Oprah Winfrey got in like big trouble with the meat industry? Do you know that one? That yeah, I can. Milk. I know the entire story. Yeah. Um, so for folks that aren't familiar, essentially, uh, during the time of BSE, also known as mad cow disease, Oprah brought Howard Lyman on, who is a big um, former rancher termed uh, vegan advocate. And he discussed mad cow disease. And Oprah publicly said on her show, uh, this has made me never want to eat a hamburger again. And so the beef industry actually sued Oprah for wow. saying, it, it was the biggest drop in beef sales in decades wow. it happened, wow. right? But she was and, breaking a law, right? Like she broke a law by saying that or something? Yeah, oh, like yes. slander the meat industry or something? So there's a law. Yep. It's called, they're nicknamed the veggie libel laws. Like I said, Healy, there's a lot of these laws. Right. And so you are not allowed to disparage a USDA product, including beef. And so they brought her all the way to Amarillo, Texas. And they sued her and she went directly to court and she said uh, they threatened to sue her. Uh, fun fact, uh, the secretary of ag at the time in Texas was Rick Perry. And mm -hmm. he's the one that led this lawsuit and brought it, um, brought it to court. And she said that she would absolutely not renege or apologize and that it is freedom of speech and she is allowed to say it. And she doesn't care if they try to suppress her. And so she went based on principle all the way to court. Um, the argument at the time was that she was making a statement about an American beef, and it was, at the time, only UK beef that had mad cow disease. Uh, so she won. She ended up winning that case. And it is probably the single best example of the might of the beef industry, but they lost. They lost to Oprah. And about three years after that case was uh, settled, mad cow disease came to America. And it's now in countries all over the world. There was a case in Brazil um, just very recently. And so, you know, their argument was mad cow disease is insular. It's never going to spread. And of course it spread. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, my head was spinning when I first heard the story a long time ago. And that was kind of my lesson in lobbying and 
that's excellent that she won, but the fact that there was even a position to be held and, and there was yeah, an issue crazy. at hand is is pretty wild. Well, to me. but that's the takeaway is that the only one that can take down the meat industry maybe is Oprah. She's the only yeah. one, she's the only hope. She, yeah, Oprah is to this day one of the most successful examples of all time of, mm -hmm. of being able to fight back on the meat industry. So mm -hmm. it just goes to show you that, again, there is laws that are literally written that you cannot criticize the meat, you know, oh, wow. and so that's kind of crazy. I will say, though, on the flip side, um, those laws do apply to other types of USDA products. And so there is a similar lawsuit that is going through right now against Milk Pep, which is the organ um, the organization that runs the Got Milk campaign, because they disparaged plant-based milk in a recent ad a few months yeah. ago. And so now they are using that exact law to sue and say, well, plant-based milk is a, a USDA product here as well. Um, I would argue that probably cultivated meat because it's now approved by the USDA has that same protection. And so we might see a case very soon where you're getting people disparaging very publicly, you know, lab grown Franken meat, and then they sure. can sue that too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the same, I mean, using those tactics is I, I think part of the toolkit, right? The playbook. I mean, no, we're not just going to say only the bad people lobby and the good people don't lobby. I mean, we're going to lobby and use the courts and the system. I mean, every tactic uh, almost, you know, it has to be, has to be taken. So that that's the lobbying side, the legal side, all that work that has to be done awareness, um, like from the book that you wrote. And then I know, um, you know, technology and innovation is a big part of probably maybe one of the, the women uh, that are part of uh, VWS or I know through joyful VC, you're kind of tackling the same thing and, and supporting food technology there. So who knows, maybe there's some tech or an individual there, or, I mean, I think probably the group together doing this is what's going to help, but maybe there'll be a big win there. Yeah, absolutely. We know that there's a lot of different instances in the history of the modern world where technology is just completely when it reaches that inflection point and has that big breakthrough moment, completely change the way that we that we operate, right? The car is a great example. It's like unfathomable to consider that we were all on horses, but we were. And yeah. a lot of people believe, you know, especially people that are vegan or advocates of this space believe that there will be a time when we look back and say, oh my gosh, we raised these like animals to kill them for meat. Why wouldn't we have just done it this way all along, right? So. Yeah. You just have to, you have to dream a little bit bigger because that is how historically innovation has always worked. Um, I think the best years are ahead of us. I think that there is tremendous opportunity from a food innovation perspective. That to me is going to be the silver bullet for climate. Um, there's a lot of energy transitioning and big, big projects that will need to happen for that aspect food is comparatively a lot simpler. It actually really is a lot simpler. So if we can just build the, you know, political support and the public momentum for food to be an area where we put our energy and we put our time, I think we can actually grow leaps and bounds. I love it. You're um, very inspirational in your positivity and like you don't get set back. And I love that you're candid about the fact that this is a multi-generational fight and you're not expecting instant results or instant gratification. Really, it's really inspiring that you're willing to fight for this cause and you know that your fight will be continued by others. Um, it's really nice. And yet you remain very positive and optimistic about it. It's cool. Seriously. There's a lot to be excited about. You know, there's, there's just around the corner there are great things and, you know, by many stretches of the imagination, by many metrics, the world is a very, very good place right now. And there are many people that have been able to, as you know, yes, we have 700 million people that are starving, but the amount of people we've lifted out of poverty in just a few decades, you know, the ways that technology have been able to transform a better world and a better life for, for billions of people, I believe that that can also happen for 90 billion animals as well. Love it. I agree. And I think it's got to happen. And we will um, do our best to elevate food within the uh, ESG discussion at the opportunities that we have. Um, today was a good opportunity to do that. Before we go, Jennifer, again, thank you for that incredible inspiration, uh, as well as the 
the education uh, on the issue at hand. But we have to have a little fun real quickly uh, in addition to that, or our fans would be very upset with us. There's a very simple game we play. It's called Beans or Barley. Uh, in the world of um, artisan type creation, we're um, talking about either a microbrewery of beer or a coffee maker, okay? So they either use beans or barley. So all you got to do is guess, beans or barley. I'm just going to tell you a name and you say they use beans or they use barley. That's all I got to do. The name is Weeping Radish. Weeping Radish. Uh, I would say barley. That's right. They make beer. Congratulations. Uh, you won the game. Why did I pick Weeping Radish? Um, usually or often I pick something regionally um, connected to the guest. Weeping Radish is, uh, I found them on a PETA list of beers suitable for vegans. So again, personally, I love PETA. You go there, you say, what beers can I drink? They've figured it all out for you. They pointed me to, um, to Weeping Radish out of North Carolina. And within uh, that brewery, there's still only certain beers that they're claiming you know, to be vegan or whatever, but hence the uh, Weeping Radish. I love it. Well, very cool. We'll have to check it out. Good plug for them. And uh, I really appreciate the conversation and, and everything that we chatted about. We took it a lot of different ways, but I hope that everyone listening can take something out of this conversation and move forward with it. I think so. And I don't often say this to guests, but I could do two more hours with you. Like <laughs> this is so interesting and I have so many more questions. So if you're ever in Chicago, let us know. But um, as far as podcasting goes, uh, this has been another wonderful episode of the ESG Experience Podcast. We appreciate all of our listeners. If you enjoyed your time with us, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast directory. There's a new episode every month. And we appreciate the support of our podcast. If you do want to continue the conversation between episodes, follow us on your favorite social media channel at hashtag ESG Experience. And Jenny, thank you again. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time.